This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. All right, everybody. Hey, SummerSlam has come and gone. It is now time to look forward to Bash at Berlin, and we have plenty of time to preview that show, which we don't even know what the hell the card's going to be. But it's at the end of this month, so two PLEs in a month. We're back overseas. Those of you overseas will be very glad because you get to show up the U.S. crowds and be as loud as you can be, and that's something I know you all love doing. Uh, but I am here, obviously, to re- review SummerSlam that just took place last night, and I've been pretty quiet, pretty radio silence everywhere, on from really from Patreon to Twitter or X and, and everywhere else. And uh, really, it's, it's because I've been traveling I, I've been barely had time to actually watch the damn show, but I did. I saw saw everything. And we're going to get through all those matches. What do we have? Six, seven matches on the card, which is a lot for a Triple H PLE. I see why they're trying to split the event into two nights and make it like a WrestleMania. They're doing it in a stadium, setting attendance records. The card is bigger. And that's what they're trying to do, trying to make money. And I can't blame them, but we got a lot to get to. I mean, there is so much to ha- that has gone on. A PLE that for the first time in a long time, I think I went seven for seven, including how everything would end. I mean, I'm I'm not tuning my own horn, but almost everything that I predicted for the first time in maybe forever, I think I might have had a flawless record, not just, you know, um, in, in, uh, in just who was going to win, but how now, I don't know if I predicted Finn, I'd have to go back and listen with the Finn turn. Uh, But maybe I brought it up in passing. That was a surprise to many, even though if you've been watching for the past several months, it makes sense that Finn turned on Priest with Gunther now champion, uh, Punk and Drew and Seth as the referee. Now, everything that I've heard, I've I've seen everybody's that I well, that I could anyway, their thoughts and reviews on SummerSlam and many are praising it as the best PLE under the Triple H regime the best SummerSlam in history and all the rest. And I think there's a lot of what's the most recent is the most intense going on, but that doesn't mean I don't think the PLE was good. In fact, I think it was very good, not just because I was right on my predictions, although maybe that factors into it. I think that the the quality of the wrestling, the crowd was pretty good, although the stadium does allow a lot of noise to escape. The stadium was relatively alive for most of the event. The return of Roman Reigns, and I guess we'll start there because you got to pick somewhere. Roman Reigns is back. Now, the match with Triple or Triple H with uh, Cody Rhodes and Solo, I really enjoyed the heck out of that match. Slow paced, methodical at times, which is what it needs to be. Everything I think is starting to maybe slow down. In terms of pace, everything doesn't need to be at a breakneck cruiserweight pace. So I, I enjoyed the match, physical. Uh, you know, some of the spots were well done. Uh, the the Cody Cutter he didn't flub, which was nice to see. You know, the match is what you thought it would be, and and you know, here's an aspect I was thinking about that really no one seems to be, including myself, up until I had the thought, is Solo Sokoa. Many people are talking about Cody and Roman's possible return and who could return and interference and all the rest, which it did happen. But what about the, what about this match for solo? What does it mean for his career? I don't think anybody's really talking about that. Everything's been so focused on the other side of things with possible returns and Cody. What does this mean for solo? And, And I think this was quietly solo's biggest match of his career. The most eyeballs on his, on, um, on him, I believe his first one-on-one main event, although I could be wrong on that first, certainly first title main event on a PLE. So 
massive for Solo's career. He had to have had a ton of pressure going into this, but no, the thing is he got lucky in that most people aren't looking at the match that way. They looked at it as when's Roman coming back? Who's coming back? Who's coming back? Who's interfering? What about Cody? That That's how most people viewed this rather than what does this mean for Solo? But Solo, I think, delivered in a big way. So I wanted to give Solo his credit as well. Now, was everything perfect in this match? No, there were some flubs. There were some bad, bad punches thrown where they were being way too soft with one another. And particularly, I don't know whose fault it was, but the the Cody Rhodes when he does an homage to his dad with those punches and, and all the rest and, and like, you know, the, the L, bionic elbow. One, some of those punches were, were horrific. I mean, horrible. <laughs> but, but it's a small little flying the ointment to what was otherwise I think a very good match and it did what it needed to do. You kind of foresaw the interference of Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa. If it didn't happen, you would have been, in, you know, floored. And you had Randy and you had Kevin Owens come out, stunners, RKOs. They neutralized each other and then they fought through the crowd. And that's when the Samoan werewolf comes out does his thing after i mean there might have been by the way like five i think five crossroads in this match i mean i'm pretty sure on that it was too many put my feelings about cody rhodes's nonsensical just just stomach churning character aside from my perspective it was too many finishes. I don't care who's in the match. I don't care if it's Rock versus Austin. Okay, I don't care if it's uh, you know Hogan Andre, which would never happen back then. It's this is more of a recent issue with pro wrestling. But my God, we are now at the point where we ha- we know we need to see in, in really big match situations a minimum of three crossroads for Cody to get the victory, or four because Cody. You always have the person kick out on the first crossroads. And then on the uh, the second round, you usually have him do it three times because he's like, crap, this is a really bad finish. I'm going to have to deliver it three times. So you're going to have a minimum now of four, but I'm pretty sure there was five. Somebody will fact check me. And that's fine. I don't, again, put my feelings to Cody aside. There's too many finishes, too many finish kick outs. And that goes across the board, which we saw all night. I mean, there, there were some great, by the way, some really fun false finishes like Oblivion from Liv Morgan being kicked out of by Rhea, which has never been done ever, by the way. One of the very few finishes in WWE that was still somehow probably unintentionally protected that uh, is no longer. That was a that's a kick out that's deserving of it. But when you see Cody, we've all been educated now and conditioned to think, <laughs> well, you're going to need to hit at least three or four. That's not a finish. Change up your finish if it doesn't finish the match. It's not really, it doesn't deserve the title of a finish maneuver. Again, I don't care what it is or who it is, but uh, that's the one other thing I had to say about that match. Um, And then, of course, you have the big return, which I have some thoughts on. Not all of them are glowing, as you'd imagine from my negative filled mind, but let's talk about the good stuff first. All right. Crowd pop, huge. New music seems good. Refresh for his babyface character. Uh, you, you know, you usually do that when you have a big change in story, big change in character. Doesn't always, but sometimes does result in new music, and we got that here. New T-shirt for those of you that care about such things. We don't know what those uh, acronyms was it OTG or OTC, whatever that means. I'm not sure what that means yet. Um, but also, Roman didn't come out smiling. Uh, no smile. So that was, inter- that was interesting, but I liked it really liked that because he didn't just suddenly change back to the big dog nonsense or suddenly he loves the fans for some reason. No, I mean, I, I think that a change for Roman should be absolutely almost nothing other than running down the crowd. The crowd started to love you despite all of those things. They didn't start to love you because you suddenly started pandering to them. They loved you because they missed you and they wanted to see you take back your rightful throne as tribal chief. You know, when the, when the parents are away, the dogs will play or however the saying goes, that's kind of what happened here. 
And there's a certain respect that people have for Roman at this point. No title. That really helps, too. The title reign, that monumental four-year title reign is no longer. So all of the things that people didn't like about Roman are gone. The big dog character, the title reign that, that really exhausted a lot of people. Uh, his absences, which now are a, an asset because people really want to see him. All of those are gone. And we had four years to hate him. And he did a great job. They all, everybody did involved, did an amazing job. So you have Roman Reigns come back, new music, fine. Crowd exploded. You couldn't really hear the crowd too much during his entrance. And maybe that's because the walkway is four miles long or because the sound escaped, which usually does happen in a stadium setting, which is the one drawback of a stadium. And he comes into the ring and Superman punches solo spears, solo Cody and Roman share a stare. Roman gives a, a small nod to Cody as he walks out. He then watches on as Cody hits the 14th crossroads and gets the one, two, three. And uh, Roman seemingly is angered, conflicted, but he's back. And it made sense that, I mean, you're not going to have another program again with Cody and Roman. That's done. It's over. So you didn't expect an attack from Roman on Cody. It would have made no sense. Also, Michael Cole hilariously, I think by trolling the fans, said, Never in a million years did I ever expect Roman Reigns to come back and do what he did. Really? See, like, really, Michael? You sure? If you spent five minutes on Twitter under the wrestling hashtag of SummerSlam, I mean, it was like trending for how, how long, how many wrestling outlets were talking about it. What happens if Roman returns? Does uh, does he uh, or when does he attack Solo? I mean, it was just like he he had to have known he was trolling the fans, or I mean, he seemingly was doing it on purpose. <laughs> just come on, Cole. If he wasn't, and he was actually just trying to do his job and pretend that this was so incredibly unpredictable, I'm not. I mean, I'm not buying it either way. But Cole's doing his job, I guess, but it, I, there had to have been some trolling there. Anyway, Roman's back. And it was big and it was monumental and the crowd loved it and goosebump moment as a lot of people have speculated or uh, as reacted rather now for the outcome again, I think it was the right move. You're not going to have Cody lose the belt. You want to know how I know. And I've said this many times. I keep reminding myself and I'm going to remind you guys. Uh And this is not a schools in session moment. I don't mean it in that tone. I just mean it in here's a big reminder. You guys remember back in April of 2024, right after WrestleMania 40. You guys might be old enough to remember the rock and Cody before the rock left for Hollywood again on his hiatus had a moment with Cody where they both traded belts. They both stood there and they both held each other's belts. And The Rock was staring, obviously, at the Undisputed Championship and saying, this feels right. It feels good. That was a massive foreshadowing to their eventual title match, which could take place at next year's WrestleMania 41, could take place at the Rumble, could take place elsewhere. It could. But that means, what that means, yes, The Rock is going to be given a title shot upon his return. But it also means that Cody's not dropping the belt at minimum until The Rock returns. So I hate to spoil the party for you that are hoping Cody drops the belt or looking for some unpredictability, but they wouldn't have done that with the rock if they didn't plan on Cody holding the belt until minimal time as such the rock comes back. So there now onto some things that I have questions about and I'm neutral. This isn't a complaint session yet. I was kind of wondering, you know, don't no, no Jimmy, no Jay, which is fine. I would think that you'd build up to the Roman return instead of bringing Roman back and then doing the, you know, kind of the henchman second. Usually you build up to the boss and not the other way around. But again, I said it and I continue to stand by it. There's no real bad way to do this. You're bringing Roman Reigns back. You're going to have the OG bloodline versus the the rogue bloodline. It's happening. We, we got that officially you know, made official, as Pierce would say. At SummerSlam last night, two nights ago. Sorry. Uh, well, no, is it two nights last night? Last night. Sorry, I keep. I don't know what the hell day it is. Sorry, guys, I'm I'm all screwed up this weekend. 
And so no Paul Heyman, no Usos, which is fine. Um, but it's also kind of, you know, I, I think at some point you're, here's what's going to happen. I think now that they've done it the other way, which they could have done it with the Usos coming back and then them getting beaten down and Roman, here comes Roman. This is seemingly going to be Roman getting beat down by, uh, by the uh, rogue bloodline on a weekly basis. It'll be a four on one scenario for maybe a week or two. Here comes Jimmy to try to even it out. Then it's four on two. Then here comes Jay to even out. Now it's four on three, getting a little closer. And then eventually, Sami Zayn. I think Sami Zayn is that guy because also he's the one that dropped the belt on summer at SummerSlam. And I said, I think he's dropped the belt because, because that would move the chess piece into place where he could now be a part of the bloodline story. Now, as I've said, you have both Jay and and Sammy on Raw, they could easily be traded, or we can just not care and do the Vince McMahon policy where we just do it and fans don't care. Um, that's possible. But there is that little wrinkle, if you will, that those guys aren't on the brand that they need to be to, in order for this storyline to work in its, in its, uh, to its full potential. But we'll get there. I think they'll find a way. They always do. If it's nothing more than just doing it and not saying anything, which they've done even under the Triple H regime. So there's that. And again, I think, again, Paul and the Usos are on their way. After Roman gets beat down and beat down and beat down, he'll get saved by, I think, the Usos. Now, on to the weird stuff. Um, the, the referee's cameras on their head, why? What view do I want from a referee's perspective? It's lower video quality by a large margin. And also it's very dizzying. It's not footage I want to watch, even if it was as good of a quality as those very expensive cameras that they have at ringside. But there's no, also there's no interest. Like I know they're trying to do different things and they're trying different things with production. And I can admire that. And I understand. Okay. But here, here's, here's the thing. Experiment tried, experiment failed. Stop. I think there was nothing added to it. Even who who came with it? Seth Rollins came out with some kind of, they might've had the Apple, uh, got, um, Apple vision pro on. It might've been th those things. I'm not sure, but stop it. I, I mean, I don't, I don't need the view from the referee's perspective. I don't care what his view is. I mean, no disrespect. I don't care. It's dizzying. Uh, I know that they're trying to make it so we can kind of pretend that we can not pretend, but rather, <clears throat> um, live through the talent's eyes or the referee's eyes, what they see. But no one's ever calling for that. Like when it's not like everyone's like, Oh my God, won't that be awesome when we can see this or that? It's like, no, <laughs> I mean like I'm good, you know? So they tried. I don't like it. They should get abolish it immediately, immediately. Sorry. Didn't work. But outside of that, we also are getting a lot of behind the curtain stuff. That's, Almost like a reminder constantly that what we're watching is a, is a production. It's predetermined. They have pulled back the curtains so much that they're doing it on their own show before the matches. And what do I mean by that? Yes, I'm going to talk about the Cody Rhodes pre-match nonsense. Because do I need to see him sitting on his bus? And how are we... By the way, this is supposed to be such a relatable guy. He's the everyman. He's the guy that you'd see walking down the street in your in your local supermarket, and he's just he's the cashier man. He's the hardworking man. That's who he is. He's the he's the greeter at Walmart. You know, he's your local paper boy. Do they even still have paper boys? Probably not. I'm I'm too old, but you get my drift. And then yet he's on his million dollar bus, most of the time wearing his suits. I'm like I said, I'm pretty sure he not only sleeps in them, probably showers in his suits. And um, then he's greeted with his dog. Now, yes, that's actually his dog. Cool. You're a pet owner. Are we supposed to be impressed by that or relate to that? Are we supposed to sit here and go, wow, I have a dog too. Wow. That makes me, that makes me really feel like he's a part of my community. Is, is that what we're supposed to feel? This is just, 
he is I, I, I don't even know if I can find the words anymore. This was an elongated view of watching Cody Rhodes walking. It was like him. He might as well just have green screened in a, you know, a, a view of a park on a sunny morning. He's just walking his dog, you know, walking his dog down the walkway. People are jogging, walking by and waving. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. Why? Why do I need to see his dog? So, yes, I'm, I'm spending time in his dog. You spend too much. Yeah, well, it's stupid. I don't need to see it. As, as uh, The Rock perfectly put it, his goofy ass dog. No, what are you, don't attack the dog. I'm, I'm not attacking the dog specifically. I'm attacking the presentation of using the dog to use Cody as some kind of relatable figure. He's the most produced, precise, unrelatable guy that I've ever seen as a baby face that somehow the masses are blinded by they're fooled by. And then he has this conversation with Arn Anderson as if Cody doesn't already know that the bloodlines after him, he has to tell him before the match. Oh, Hey man. Hey, listen, Hey Cody, um, just in case you forgot, I meant to tell you this, uh, you know, in case you haven't figured out over the last two years that, uh, the bloodlines coming after you, you know, during the match, look out, man. Just in case you don't know, but you got friends in high places. I mean, we all, okay. Yeah. We we all knew he was referring to Kevin Owens and, and uh, Randy Orton. I, I just, it's, it's, um, and then he comes out after walking down, uh, walking the backstage area with his dog and off his little million dollar bus. And then he wears this mask as if he's some kind of warrior. He wear, wears this skull mask as if he suddenly is by simply putting on the mask, by placing the mask on him. He is now some kind of nomad warrior, some kind of tribal, uh, tribal warrior. And it, it's such a, this is what I'm talking about. It, it's such a reminder that this is a presentation. I know that they're trying the backstage stuff. That's more of let's catch the talent in their natural element. I understand that. You see them arriving at the arena. I like that. It's brief. It shows them carrying their luggage from the airport or whatever. I don't mind that. I don't mind that every now and then. I don't need an elongated view of a guy sitting on his bus, then walking his dog. Sorry, I mean, no, actually, I'm not sorry. It was horrible. And it just cemented my further hate for his character into oblivion. Uh, and then he, he comes out and he's so coordinated with his fireworks and his, yeah, I mean, it, it, sorry. It, he is the most, he's the biggest exposure of this business being a production that I've seen in a long time. And sure, the, the company's partly responsible for this, but he still is a hell of a wrestler. We know that. He can still talk. We know that. He can. I'm not taking anything away from him in the ring. On the mic. Very good. One last question, and then I promise I will move on. (sighs) Cody Rhodes' music, at the very beginning, says, wrestling has more than one royal family. To that, I would say, well, who's asking otherwise? Who's claiming otherwise? Uh, What? (laughs) I mean, was this... An answer to a question that never was asked? I mean, who was going around saying, even in their promos ever, wrestling has only one royal family. There's no other family in wrestling that's of royalty. Uh, is it the Flares? Like, are we, the Flares, the Steiners, the Hearts? What, what, what family ever said? Well, whoever claimed this? You know, wrestling has more than one royal family. Well, thanks, Cody. No one was claiming otherwise, you know, (laughs) like this, this was not a problem, but thanks for answering it anyway. Thanks for that random, uh, you know, factoid. (laughs) And so uh, if you think I'm, you know, narrowing in on Cody a little bit, I am because they, it's like they took everything that they hear from me as, uh, what I hate about his character and then drove it into the ground last night. So congrats, WWE. I am now, as uh, some people would say today, triggered. By the way, 
there is a, a push, and this is uh, not me getting into politics. We're keeping it politic free, but I'm only mentioning it as news because Cody Rhodes himself mentioned it as news that he has been approached. This is from Cody, not from me. I'm just reporting that he was approached by both parties, Democrats and Republicans, to run for uh, office in the state of Georgia. So uh, I don't, I, I don't know if it's at the. St- I, I would imagine it's at the Senate level in in uh, Georgia, but I don't know. So it means that when Cody's done with wrestling, he could very well venture into politics, and you could see why they're attracted to him. Can you not see why the political parties that be in this country are attracted to Cody Rhodes? I mean, take a look at him. Even I mean, we've been saying on this show forever that he feels and looks and speaks like a politician. He already is a politician. He doesn't need to change anything. Why do you think they're they're gravitating towards him? That's not a compliment, by the way. That's not a compliment to Cody that you're attracting people that that are lifelong in politics that want you to come to their side. It's not like it's not really a compliment. I mean, so um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that to your attention because he's actually in code. You don't blame me if I'm just, oh, he's trying to bring up politics again. I'm not. Go Google it. So if you want Cody in politics, again, I mean, he doesn't really have to change a thing. He just has to wear his suit that he wears every day. It's just to me, to him, it's instead of walking into the ring and cutting a promo, he's going to walk into his office. You know, there's not really much change. Change in pay, probably a big time change in pay. But for Cody, it's just kind of another day. Except, uh, you know, I'm going to go to my office instead of go to the ring. (laughs) I'm going to look the same, dress the same, walk the same. Bring my stupid ass dog and maybe I'll bring my dumb ass dog into the uh, my office. Maybe I'll, uh, you know, put put a cage in there or or rather put, put some dog food down. Put some newspaper or let them crap on the floor. Oh, my God. All right, I'm going off. Let's go on to something else, I promise. Let's go. Let's go to Nia Jack. Something really good here. Outcome was correct. Was the match really good? Yes. Nia Jax, I continue to say, has really shown how good she can be. And she's found herself. Boy, has she found herself. Uh, she could be better in the ring from certain perspectives. Some of her moves are a little bit, you know, um, a little need some sharpening. Um, her annihilator finish needs to look a little better without killing the woman. And I know it's a fine line and you got to actually try to make it look good without looking like you're, you know, actually killing the person or that you're trying to protect them. It's a, it's a not, it's not easy to do, but that can be cleaned up a bit. Um, you know, some of her, you know, some of her more, I guess, high flying is the word. She gets on, you know, second rope and does things and you, you kind of hold your breath. I give her credit, though. She has done everything she needed to do to give us a really good match with the size difference. Bailey with the uh, power bomb was awesome off the second rope. Uh, credit to her. Bailey to belly has now transitioned from a signature or a finish to a signature move, as we know. So she kicked out of that. And uh, uh, we had Nia Jax win with uh, Tiffany Stratton seemingly there to cause the distraction that she was going to cash in, but didn't long enough for Nia Jax to hit the Annihilator again and again, which, by the way, even this match had a protected finish kicked out of in the Annihilator uh, kicked out of by Bailey, and then uh, Nia Jax went back to the well twice more, and then Bailey was uh, w- was no longer champion. And if Tiffany Stratton and Nia Jax celebrated, really fun here. I mean, was it blow away? No, but it was what it needed to be because WWE very clearly and sadly had no plans for Bailey post Mania, none, zero. She felt irrelevant. She felt forgotten. She felt forgotten and irrelevant up till her match with EO Sky at WrestleMania. And they did nothing with her. And when she won, Bailey must be sitting there going like, what am I doing? You know, I'm champion and they're not doing anything with me. So it was weird. 
But Nia Jax, I think, is a perfect change of pace. I think she's going to actually absolutely, uh, she should crush it. Uh, and also, for her and for Gunther, both winning King, King and Queen of the Ring, it establishes some prestige, if you will, to winning that tournament now that it does lead to championship victories or can. So it was important that those victories at King of the Ring led to actual championship victories at SummerSlam. Because if don't forget, those winners automatically get a title shot at SummerSlam now, which I really like. Um, and so they really are mimicking WrestleMania, where King of the Ring and Queen of the Ring are now the equivalent of the Royal Rumble matches that lead to WrestleMania, where the King of the Ring and Queen of the Ring winners lead to SummerSlam. They are literally m- mirroring just changing the dates and the, and the the titles, but it's the same exact concept. In fact, it's the same time frame from winning to getting your opportunity. So they, they're just mirroring WrestleMania. They, I mean, they can't wait a full year anymore. They have to just somehow find a way to have two WrestleManias in a year. But Nia Jax winning, I think, was the right move. I really like this, and hopefully they have a plan for her, a long-term plan, meaning like just, Three months. Just give me the next three three or four months. You know, get me through the end of the year. I really hope they have something for her that's beyond just, oh, that's right. We have a women's champion. Uh, you know, they're, oh, crap. You know, let's put her on the, the PLE with no build to a, a matchup. You know, I think Nia, we still haven't seen the best nays of Nia Jax yet, and that's uh, that's exciting. Interestingly, there was no big names on here, like Bianca Belair, who's been sorely underutilized last year. Obviously, um, her tag team partner and Jade Cargill not there. Some other notable uh, omissions from the show. But kind of weird that Bianca Belair (laughs) especially is not on the show in any capacity. It's weird. But Nia Jax wins. Tiffany Stratton, that whole dynamic with her and Nia is going to be fun to see how that plays out as well. And when does she cash in on Nia? So... Another title change. Boy, was it a night of title changes, and I warned you it could be. Logan Paul and L.A. Knight. Insert, yeah. Really good match. Um, as it, as it, you knew it would be. And, and, and the moves that L.A. Knight can do off the top rope are downright scary. And I mean scary and not that it's unsafe, but there is a high risk involved no matter how good you are. And we all know that Logan Paul is a freak of nature. His springboard moonsault on the outside. I mean, I think he went halfway up the ramp. He's insane as well. His entourage getting their ass kicked was fun. Cole's really into his entourage getting their ass kicked. And then uh, we had, um, oh, who's that musician? Uh, yeah. What's his name? What's his name? I can't think of it right now. Um, he ends up handing the necklace machine gun Kelly got it. He ends the necklace that he had around his neck, which had a brass knuck fit for uh, Logan Paul into LA night. He only gets a jab with the, uh, with the actual knucks. So the referee didn't see it. LA night kicks out and LA night then uh, does what he does and gets some, um, you know, some, uh, some revenge BFT, Bam, good night, the lights, new U.S. champ. And L.A. Knight post press conference even said, you know, it's about damn time. And it is. It's I mean, you talk about long overdue. That's an understatement. Um, this was, I mean, about a year and a half ago would have made more sense. But he's here now and he's U.S. champion. And I think that that's a it's a step in the right direction for L.A. Knight. And you do wonder, here's the quite million dollar question. Given LA Knight's age, and he's 40, I think, 40, 41, given that the fans somewhat, but not significantly, but somewhat from his peak have cooled off on him, somewhat, I'd say like a peg down or two, do you think this is LA Knight's ceiling? Do you think that when we look back at LA Knight's career, that we're going to point to SummerSlam 2024 as LA Knight's peak? I hope not, but I can see a world in which this is actually the most likely scenario. I don't know if LA Knight is destined for a world title victory. 
or an undisputed title victory. It just doesn't seem likely. And that's because you have Cody Rhodes at the top and then the whole, the rocks coming back and, and you know, what are they going to do with that? And you know, there's just a whole mix of things. So unless LA Knight goes to raw, which I actually was hoping they would do when the shakeup happened earlier this year, I don't see LA Knight winning at least the undisputed. The world title is, I think is much more of a possibility in LA Knight's career, at least over the next uh, 12 months, but really good match. And uh, LA Knight, just kicked ass. The crowd was into it and Logan Paul was into it ever. I mean, it was, it was really good, really good. Enjoyed the hell out of it. Now onto jelly roll and the Miz and our truth. Awesome truth. And of course, Grayson Waller and Austin theory that are somehow still a team. You kind of knew it was going to happen here. The Miz is first of all, <laughs> I mean, the Miz is just now relegated to just by default being the host of the, uh, you know, the show, which, what do hosts do exactly? <laughs> what do they do? They come out. They're just good for attendance record announcements now. I don't know what hosting an event even means anymore, but that's what the Miz did. Um, and it led to Jelly Roll getting physically involved here and using a steel chair to take out Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. I mean, and he did his thing and he even hit, did he hit a choke slam on Austin Theory. Jelly Roll hit a choke slam on Austin Theory. I mean, if you're going to have anyone sell it, Austin Theory is the guy to do it. But Jelly Roll, a guy named Jelly Roll, is now beating a guy that was once believed to be the next big thing by Vince McMahon. <laughs> He's getting choke slammed by a guy that has a, as much muscle on, you know, on his arm as my four-year-old does. I mean, sure, there's a lot of weight there, but let's be honest. I mean, he's a, he's a he's a obese man. He he just is, and he's talented. I have nothing against Jelly Roll. No, nothing personal. I don't really care for his music, but I don't, that doesn't mean anything. Just objectively, he's 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 obese, and so we're supposed to believe that he can take out a guy that is you know spends his life in training. He's he's a all world athlete, and we have Jelly Roll. Even the name. Jelly roll is embarrassing that if you got your ass kicked by somebody named that, uh, but it's pro wrestling. I didn't take it too seriously. You're not supposed to take it too seriously. The chair shots were funny. Um, Jelly roll has been involved in WWE for, you know, a couple of times now. It's a whatever, whatever. So, all righty. Well, on to more important things as well. Um, we ended up also getting the world title match. Punk drew, Seth. Now, this match going in had a ton of build. They, the the hype machine for this was through the roof. I think the hype machine was a little over the top at times. But I here's what I I'd say: the match, if you take out Seth Rollins' unnecessary, I think, uh, involvement in this, I think the match delivered. I think Punk return to form um he looked like to me the punk of old it's as good a punk as you could hope for at this age and we got it punk looked great in great physical condition stephanie mcmahon at ringside was weird <laughs> i don't mean she was weird i mean having her in the audience clapping and it's weird she's trying to be like a fan and it's like why and she is a fan and triple H even said she has no official role in the company. She's a fan. She enjoys this. You know, sometimes it's harder to love this more than others. And now she really has started to love it again. Meaning if you read between the lines, even, even triple H paused before he said that to gather exactly how he wants to say it is, Hey, yeah. When Steph was here and she resigned as the CFO, uh, she was not having fun. It sucked. Her dad was, you know, uh, really making this a miserable place. And now that I'm in charge, Hey, things are more or better. It's more fun now. So she's coming to enjoy the events more. That's what that means. That's what that meant. So seeing Steph is cool. She doesn't age ever. I mean, like ever. <laughs> um, so it was cool to see her. And there was footage, cell footage, cellular uh, cell phone footage of, uh, was CM Punk and Stephanie embracing in a hug. 
So that's kind of an interesting dynamic there. And um, hey, I mean, I've got nothing against Steph. She's to me one of the best villains of all time, by the way, too. Um, great, great villain. And um, so anyway, the match, my God, really good here. The uh, the GTS, sure, one of them was a little sloppy. The GTS is difficult to really navigate, though, because you got to make it look good without actually kneeing the person in the face. It's not easy. Um, but there were some fun false finishes. Of course, Seth Rollins injecting himself and everything. You knew he was going to be back and forth and not counting and ignoring. And why did he, by the way, have to turn his back to have people do stuff? He still is at his discretion whether or not he wants to call the match off or disqualify someone. So, like, why does he have to turn his back? I mean, it was at one point, I think, didn't Punk or Drew tell him to turn his back and let me take care of this? And, you know, Seth is uh, turning his back so they can do what they need to do. And then uh, it's like, well, even if you saw it blatantly, like, it's still at your discretion. I mean,. <laughs> <laughs> just it's just weird. Uh, the the pants I didn't care for on Seth. He was a distraction unnecessarily at times. He didn't turn heel, but I think that he was an unnecessary distraction. They put him in in this match to kind of hype up Punk versus Seth, uh, and I know why. But that was already hyped up before and sizzling underneath the surface before this match with Drew. We don't need Seth in this match. We didn't, and uh, CM Punk ended up hitting a GTS on Seth, and um, you know, Punk never got stomped. Nobody got stomped, which was really, really um, mind blowing. And we had Drew Claymore Punk one, two, three. Seth counts down the shoulders of Punk, and Drew wins, which was the right choice. Drew needs a victory. In the worst way. And, you know, the idea is that Punk cost himself the match, in which he did. And so maybe that was the reason they didn't want to have Punk lose clean to Drew. After Drew, I mean, but Drew did hit a low blow, so they could have done that with a regular referee. If that's the finish, here's the thing. If that's the finish of the match that they would have done otherwise, or regardless, they don't need Seth in there to do what he needed to do. The, the, because to me, Seth is a distraction from what is a, a program that does not need Seth at this moment. You can get to Punk and Seth after, and they will, and they are, but you don't need kind of both going on simultaneously. It, it, it distracted for me what was otherwise a great story because you're always wondering, oh, who's going to turn on who? Is Seth going to enforce this rule? Is he going to enforce that rule? I don't want to think that. I want to be thinking, hey, Remember all that pent up frustration that Drew had for Punk? What's he going to do here? What's he going to do there? What's Punk going to do? Instead, we're worried about what Seth is yelling back to Drew and shoving Punk and Punk. And here, oh, here comes the bracelet. Like, I understand all of it. I'm not losing my mind over it. It's just, to me, disappointing that they had Seth in this role that, to me, was unnecessary. It was unnecessary and it took away. It just, and it's crazy saying the a guy, the talent, uh, the level of talent of Seth could say it's taking away, but in this case it was. It took away from the match a little bit for me, but the match was still very good. Now we have fully full, uh, full steam ahead for Punk and Seth. I think Drew is done. I think Drew is absolutely done. Uh, with Punk for the moment anyway, although you could argue he kept the bracelet of Punk, which was surprising and would tell you maybe it's not over. So there is that little bit hanging over, uh, hanging over the dark, dark cloud, hanging over things. If you want Punk and, and uh, Drew to be over with, because I had figured after Drew did that, he would have taken the bracelet and just slammed it, you know, just threw it at Punk and then left the ring. That would have kind of uh, signified the end of that program, but it didn't. And he didn't. Um, but maybe that is, this is the end of it, and uh, Seth and Punk are up next. But that begs the question, what does Punk do at WrestleMania? I mean, because Seth and Punk was supposed to be WrestleMania, as we all know. They can't string out Punk and Seth to WrestleMania. There's no chance. So that means Punk's going to have to do something else at WrestleMania. What is that thing? 
We don't know. John Cena? We don't know. I mean, John Cena, don't forget, he's going to be injected back into the WWE in a big way very soon. And when I say very soon, that's, wait a minute, five months? So it's really not that soon, but the months go quick. So anyway, um, that's uh, that's my take on that. Again, uh, Drew winning, I think, was the right call. He needed it. All right. Now on to the world title match. World title match, Priest versus Gunther. The blood on the chest of Gunther from the chops. My God, can you imagine? the the Just how hard do you have to hit somebody? <laughs> I mean, jeez, my God. Both men deserve credit here. It's as advertised, as advertised. And having... Um, yeah, having Finn come out and do what he did, screwing over Priest, and then the look he gave the camera, it's about time Finn does something relevant. It has been a long time since Finn Balor has done anything that we're all talking about. He's been he's been a guy that's just kind of a, a foundational piece of the Judgment Day. He doesn't ever have a solo program. He's been occasionally a tag team champion. He's a solid, I'm sorry, that's an understatement, a very good, exceptional in-ring talent, decent on the mic, and he's been kind of standing in the shadows for a long time. Now he's stepping out. Now the the, the bloodline, or rather the blood, the judgment day is fractured, and the two heels have really stepped out. Now what's J.D. McDonough going to do? Probably just be the, the tag along. I can't see J.D. McDonough turning babyface. Uh, we'll get to Dom in a minute. But for me, Priest getting screwed by Finn is a, is, is a perfect way to finish that because Priest has an immediate program to go into. He can hang his head high with the job he did as world champion, which exceeded, I think, most people's expectations. He faced a guy in Gunther that he gave everything and more to. Gunther was on his game, uh, as he always is. Priest was as well. And there was a moment with the sleeper that you figured, okay, hey, he, you know, he's out. And then he rolled up. He got out of it and then rolled up uh, uh, Gunther. And you're like, oh, my God. And then Gunther hit his powerbomb and hit the sleeper. There's been, there was a lot of hulking up in that match. You know, like... He just got energy from the heavens out of nowhere several times in that match. But the end result was new world heavyweight champion Gunther. Now Gunther's on a different path. Priest is on his own path, chasing down uh, Finn Balor. And that's I think both trajectories are perfect. I think they are done with one another for a while. I can't see Priest challenging Gunther in the immediate future anyway. Maybe Seth Rollins does. I think Seth Rollins versus Gunther is a lot of fun. But then Seth Rollins is going to be with Punk. And maybe, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. Things got shooken up in a big way at SummerSlam. Easily the most, one of the most newsworthy events to come from the Triple H regime. One that easily had the most title changes under Triple H's watch thus far. Because Triple H does not do title match uh, changes or title changes very often. In fact, he has a lot of PLEs where it's one or none. So this this was a a big one for for Triple H, and I think he he hit a home run. I mean, was it a grand slam? No, I, but I think it was a home run, maybe a two run shot. And he he did as good as you could imagine anyone you know with all the things he had to manage and think about and. It was a home run, for sure. Um, and Gunther is champion. Boy, does this it just feels right. Gunther is world champion. Just it has a. Or it, it feels like he's been world champion before. It feels like it's just kind of what he's meant to be. So his run as champion, I could. And I will say this. I I would say that a high percentage of those that became champion last night will carry the championships into WrestleMania. I think there's a high chance of that. Who are those people? I think Gunther is one. 
uh, probably Nia Jax as two. Braun Breaker, no. Uh, we'll, actually, we'll get to that match next and then talk about Dom. But Braun Breaker, probably not. But I think there is at least maybe like three quarters. How about that? Three quarters of the people that won last night will hold their belts into WrestleMania. So, all right. Let's talk about Braun Breaker and Sami Zayn. Easily the disappointment of the night. And I don't mean that in the result because the result could have gone both ways, but it did tell you, okay, Sami Zayn's being freed up to be a part of the bloodline story. That's one theory. I think that's probably true. This match wasn't bad. It was just short. As everyone you know, is kind of saying, it, it's just short. It, in, and I don't know why it was it was short. I don't know what time out of this match was given to another segment. I'm not sure. Or maybe it was designed to be this short, but I doubt it. It wasn't that exciting. Um, you have a spear attempt right off the bat that Sammy avoids. You know, again, kickouts of finishes all over the place. That was again prevalent through the whole night. But Sami Zayn losing to Braun Breaker after a spear uh, made sense. And Braun Breaker being anointed as champion. My God, did he, does he still need new music? But it was fine. It was okay. I'd give it like two out of five stars. It's just, okay, here's a title change. It's just, it's disappointing. And, and clearly they, they, you know, they got to the ring and they're like, man, we've only got like five minutes. What the hell? <laughs> it was short. And so I'm not faulting the talent. They did what they could, but uh, compared to the rest of the night, they're they're not exactly a match that people are going to be talking about. All right, we'll close with this. Dom screws over Rhea. And I have, you know, again, I've been saying this for a while, so toot toot, I guess, but a lot of other people did too. I'm certainly not a the lone wolf in that respect. But we did have Liv and Rhea and very good. I mean, I, this match is not over. This program is nowhere near over. Liv defending against Rhea Ripley. The match was physical. They have a lot of good chemistry together. Even though Liv is significantly smaller than Rhea, I think they did a good, did a good job of counteracting that with Liv's um, uh, speed and her aerial maneuvers and her quickness. And I think they did. And uh, Rhea Ripley trying to hit Riptide a few times. She sold the DDT like a champ. And she kicked out of Oblivion, as I mentioned earlier in the show. No one's ever done that. And then she went to hit uh, Liv Morgan with a chair and Dom stopped her. But it was smartly pointed out that she only he only stopped her at that moment because she would have lost the... the uh, lost the match and not won the championship. So that kind of made sense that Dom did that. And then we had Dom get involved and uh, he ended up distracting. Uh, it ended up distracting the referee uh, with enough time to allow Liv to hit oblivion on top of the chair. One, two, three, Liv retains and then we got the best moment that we've been all waiting for in front of Rhea. Dom kissing Liv after she loses the opportunity at the championship. The lipstick in her teeth kind of made it even better. And, and I, I love this moment. It it, it it turns Dom into an ultra heel again. Rhea has now as a baby face separated herself. Damian Priest as a baby face has separated himself. The judgment day has been fractured down the middle. Rhea Ripley did a couple, well, one great thing, one kind of weird thing here. One great thing she did, and it's not easy to do. Even with the lips, black lipstick on her teeth, um, she emoted multiple emotions in her facial expressions when she saw that. It was well executed, not just by Dom and Liv, but also by... Rhea Ripley, who was as she was staring at Liv and and Dom making out and realizing what just happened, it was you could just read in her eyes and her facial expressions. It was anger, sadness, vengeance, 
all wrapped into one facial expression that she nailed. It was beautiful. And yes, it looks like now Rhea's going to try to chase Dom, get her hands on Dom. Eventually, she's going to hit Riptide on Dom, which is fine. But we all know that obviously Dom is not going to do anything because he can't because Rhea's a woman. We all know that. That obviously doesn't go both ways. It's a one-way street when it comes to men and women physicality in WWE, which is unfortunate. But that's the payoff. I mean, everybody now wants to see Rhea hit Riptide on Dom. And I do foresee, and I hate to say it, I do foresee Rhea Ripley challenging Dom to a match at some point. Challenging Dom to a street fight. Maybe she'll come out on Raw and say, you know what, Liv? I'm going to get my shot at you again. But Dom, I want my shot at you. I don't know. At Bash at Berlin or something. Or, you know. And they'll have a street fight. I mean, I could see a scenario where that happens. I am hoping it doesn't. I hope that Liv or or Dom getting Riptide hit on him is the only thing that happens. And that it's kind of a a side thing going on for for, uh, Rhea. But Dom's the one that screwed her over. And he's the one that directly cost her and broke her heart and stole her championship opportunity. She's going to target him. So it's almost as if Liv is a side story where she's going to chase Dom primarily to get her hands on Dom. I'm scared (laughs) because the intergender thing is ridiculous in WWE. I hope it doesn't happen. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane, but the payoff is she wants to, everybody wants to see Dom get riptide. I can live with that. I just don't want to match. That's what I don't want. Um, the one thing, the weird thing I was going to talk about with, with Rhea. Are we really supposed to believe that she separated her shoulder multiple times in the matchup and then slammed her shoulder into the table and slammed her sh- a shoulder into the turnbuckle to, to pop it back in? I could have done without that, especially twice. I know it's her injured shoulder. It's a star. I would have left that out of the equation. I think it was a little much... She didn't sell it great at times. It was It's like she got her powers back when she her, her arm got popped back in. It was a little... Was, I, now, I know what they were going for. I just didn't like it. It was a weird thing for me because, you know, it was a little bit... It was a disconnect for me because it's like, yeah, that, that that's not how this works, right? Yes, you can pop your shoulder back in doing that, but it's ultra dangerous, ultra painful. And maybe that's the purpose of her doing that, that she doesn't care how much pain she has to inflict on herself to get to Rhea. Fine. But it was it was almost like I was watching like a parody of a superhero movie. But uh, again, not enough to spoil the matchup, not enough to, for me to spoil the, the, the actual story here, which has done and been done very well. So, uh, boy, this is going to be a fun Raw. If you're not excited for Raw, I mean, you're not a wrestling fan at this point. So, uh, yeah, with Roman back, no Charlotte. I was totally wrong about that. No Charlotte, although I think she is probably returning now at uh, SmackDown. And I said that. I said, you know, if she doesn't return at SummerSlam, she'll be on her way on SmackDown because Bailey versus Rhea, or rather Bailey versus Nia, is something that I think is come and gone. And uh, I think that she needs a new opponent and maybe Charlotte is the one to step in. Or you can make it a triple threat, but Charlotte is on her way back in short order. Um, but the complaint would be Charlotte, of course, is immediately injected into the title uh, match. Here we go again with it or the title shot for, uh, for uh, Charlotte, which she's not going to win, but it's just the perception. She's always involved in everything with the title. So, all right. Anyway, overall, I'd give SummerSlam four out of five stars. If you're looking for a star rating, uh, B plus, or I'm sorry, a minus is where I'd live with that for four and a quarter stars, maybe uh, whatever that equates to very good. Outside of the fact that there were some weird things, short matches, Cody Rhodes and his stupid dog and the whole backstage nonsense that I already broke down that I'm sure many of you are going to say, I'm tired of you complaining about it, but uh, I mean, it is what it is. It's not my cup of tea. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody for joining me here. And uh, I really appreciate it as you, many of you have on Patreon. I really appreciate that as well. I know we did have some of you join, uh, join us on Patreon over the SummerSlam weekend. And I want to give um, a shout out to some new patrons. Uh, let's see here. We've got Matthew Tondi. Thank you uh, for joining us. I thought there was somebody else. 
Uh, maybe not. But uh, Matt, thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoy your membership. And if anyone else would like to join us, get an ad-free experience, head on over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast or go to Patreon, or I'm sorry, Apple Podcasts and get uh, everything ad-free there or Spotify. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'll be back on Tuesday with your Monday Night Raw review, certainly one that'll be eventful, to say the very least. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.